I, I guess uh, a few points I'd want to make. I'd start with the uh, exam and the curve, the pass rate on the exams that Chuck showed, um, which is actually the same period as the condo real estate. It peaked the same year. Chuck isn't showing you the five years before where it went up to that peak and then went down. So it went up and it went down. Um, and w the graph he showed you is the initial certification pass rate, which bottomed out at 78% this year or last year. It's actually higher now. But the ultimate pass rate across the ABIM exams is between 95 and 98%. So what does that tell us? Um, I, I think there are, it's not that 22% of physicians are deficient, it's that people may not reliably do a good job assessing how well they know what they think they know. And people go take the exam cold and they say, oh, I know how to do this. And actually one in five of them maybe doesn't. And then when they get that reality check, which as I say, I saw it voluntarily in 98, then they do study. Uh, and, and I think that the significant difference between the initial cert and the ultimate pass rate is about people acquiring knowledge, which is not a bad thing from, from the point of view of patient care. I, I think um, the, the costs are, um, it's interesting to talk about the costs of MOC. The board charges the fees that it charges, and I was transparent about those. And if you pay those fees, you can get through the program without paying a dime to anybody else. That's the board's commitment. You, you, do not, you do not have to pay a dime to anybody else. Now, if you choose to go to a chapter meeting of the ACP in Pennsylvania and do an SCP module, which is a phenomenal educational experience. I did it with an ACP leader in Alaska, and it was inspiring. The chapter charges a fee. So Chuck was counting the revenue that ABIM is getting for charging for the SEP module, the $250 and then telling us that the chapter fee borne by the diplomate is $100 per diplomate for that visit, who's getting the money? And I'm actually not distressed about that in the sense that I think it's really a good thing for professional societies to develop appropriate educational materials. I think they do it better than anybody else. If people turn to professionally generated, high quality educational materials to get through MOC. I think that's a positive for patients. I think that's a positive for professional societies. I think it's a positive for doctors. There were a lot of things that I did in practice that were not revenue generating that I had to do. And whether that was paperwork or whether that was keeping up or whether that was reading journals, we're not sitting here saying, if, if, if we're gonna start talking about lifelong learning, let's recognize that the costs, a lot of the costs that Chuck is attributing to MOC are the costs associated with lifelong learning. You gotta take time away from revenue generating activities to study. You gotta find the place you wanna go to study. The board's goal in that is to find as many ways to give you credit for the places that you find uh, to do the work. So those would be the major things that I'd wanna respond to. Uh, the one other thing I'm gonna talk about briefly is nonprofit salaries and how they get set. Same thing at, um, at, at other professional leadership organizations, including ACP. The, the way that a nonprofit board compensates is they say, if we were gonna hire somebody to do this job, where would they come from? And for the job of CEO of one of these organizations, that person is gonna be a dean or a department chair. And the comparison salary that the nonprofit board has to pay if they're gonna get somebody to not be a dean or a department chair is set by um, a survey that says, well, this is what department chairs make, this is what deans make, so if you're gonna hire somebody from that pool, this is the salary you're gonna need to pay. And I, I'm making more money as CEO of ABIM than I did in 30 years of community practice, no question about it. And in 30 years of community practice, I didn't understand why I made a third of what a cardiologist made or why I earned a fraction of what an orthopedic surgeon made. I did the work I did because I wanted to do it. Salaries get set the way salaries get set. And look around at the leadership of the hospitals that you're at. Look around at what administrators get paid. That's where the salaries come from. And you want to compare that to frontline clinicians, go right ahead. But you can't hire in that marketplace. 
you can't walk into uh, a, a restaurant and say, I want to pay McDonald's prices for uh, restaurant food. And you can't hire in a competitive talent market uh, leadership that you want and need to run your organization uh, if you're not prepared to pay competitive salaries.